Uh, it's often been said that the two greatest and most important days of your life are the day that you were born and the day that you find out why. The day that you're born isn't a day that you uh, have a say in. You, you didn't get to choose or decide, hey, I want to be born this day. So you likely don't have questions about your birthday, but maybe you have questions about that second most important day of your life. Why on earth am I here? And I want you to hear this morning, I, I'm here to tell you this morning that our God is a God who answers the questions of your life. Uh, Jesus is someone who steps in not only in the, in the eternal aspects of our life, but Jesus steps in to answer the most important questions of our life, that question, what on earth am I here for? It's a question that Jesus is going to answer for us uh, this morning in, the, uh, in the, the medium, in the form of truth from his word. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn over to Matthew chapter 5, and you're like, oh, there's no introduction story for me to get warmed up here, Brandon, what, what's going on? There's no, there's no funny, there's no fun, there's no engaging, there's just scripture, and uh, we, just, we just have a lot of fish to fry and not a whole lot of time to cook it, so let's dive right in. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says this, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. There are a few hundred settlers listening to a carpenter from Nazareth as he unpacks in these first few verses what on earth they are here for. But let's not just see this as a historical moment that Jesus speaks. Let's see, this is a moment for us where Jesus speaks to us what our purpose is here on earth. Now, Dawson Trotman was the founder of a ministry called Navigators. Dawson was born in Arizona but moved to California. He was raised in church, but by the age of 20, he wanted nothing to do with anything church. Dawson Trotman, known as Dawes, was uh, born and lived in the era of prohibition. And he lived that era to its fullest. Uh, Dawson was a, a bootlegger. He was a hustler. He was a pool shark. He was a liar, a thief, a cheat. And that was the story of his life until the story of his life took a turn when he got arrested for public intoxication. And it was in that moment when he was on his way to jail that he prayed a prayer that maybe some of you have prayed in your life, Jesus, if you'll just get me out of this, I promise I'll go back to church. And the Lord delivered him from that moment. And so Dawes fulfilled his part of the promise and he shows up in church and when he showed up in church, Jesus showed up in his life in a powerful way and changed Dawes Trotman's life in that moment by the grace and the goodness and the kindness of God. Dawes Trotman met Jesus and his life was forever changed and he wanted everybody that he could tell to know about it. Uh, on his Navy battleship, he shared Jesus with uh, one of the men in the Navy with him. That person met Jesus, and then he shared Jesus with another person, and he told him how Jesus brings hope and life into any life, and that person met Jesus, and then Dawes did it again and again and again until, after several months, 125 men on that Navy battleship gave their life to Jesus and found hope in Christ. Through the years, the, the 125 men whose life had been changed became thousands and thousands of men who had been changed by Dawes telling them about Jesus. For the last 80 years, the ministry of the Navigators has expanded to reach millions 
upon millions of people for Jesus. In 1956, Dawes Trotman tragically died when he was on a boat and uh, there was a child who fell overboard. And so Dawes jumped into the water to help save this child and, and the rescue efforts went on for so long uh, that while he was able to save this child, he lost his life tragically. Billy Graham in his eulogy for Dawes Trotman said Dawes died the same way he lived, holding others up. Jesus in our text this morning says, you are the light of the world. He doesn't say that the church, some organization, some Christian or spiritual sect is the light of the world. No, he says you, the personal pronoun for you, not a collection or a group of super spiritual people, uh, not, a, not a group of people who've got it all figured out or who have all of the answers or who have reached a place in their spirituality where they, they can move into a place of changing others' lives. No, he says you, Jesus says, you are the light of the world and the salt of of the earth. What on earth is Jesus talking about? Jesus in this moment, in this text, to these people on a hillside, but to the people who are here today, says to us, I have a renewed and brand new vision for your life, that you would see yourself as a person that holds others up. We're talking about the very mission of the church. We're talking about the very mission of your life to see yourself as a conduit of the gospel that everywhere you go, that everything that you do with everyone that you're with, you are carrying the story of Jesus that changes everything for everyone. Jesus is rewriting the expectations for our life that as you marry and as you have kids, uh, as you work and interact with people, as you go to school, as you live retired, regardless of your status, your relational status, your education status, your, your economic status, regardless of any status that you have in life, we are all a conduit of God's love in our world. See, God has this great expectation that you will take the hope of Jesus to the heart and life of another so that they too will know what on earth they're here for. Now we've talked a lot about in this series our, our vision for what God has next for us as a church family. We've unpacked a little bit uh, about gathering and why we gather and the ways that we do and our hope and our prayer and our desire that drives us is that somebody would meet Jesus in this place. If that's one more person, that they would experience the hope and the life, we, we are praying and we're desperate that God would move in such a way that those who are far from Jesus, uh, far from the local church, would find the hope that's only found in Christ and the community of this church family. But when we show up here, we don't wanna just show up and take it all in as consumers because a relationship with Christ is not about more information, it's about more transformation to where we're becoming more and more like Jesus. And today we're gonna to just drill even deeper that yes, we want people to experience the hope of Christ. Yes, we want to grow in looking more like Christ, but let's drill deeper today because we were restored and we are growing to be more like Jesus for a purpose, to restore others, to hold others up. In a word, we are saved so that we can go and tell others about Christ. What do we, what do we mean when we say this word go? What does that even mean? Back to Matthew chapter five, Jesus captures in this moment, Matthew for us captures the very first several days of the public ministry of Jesus. At this point in Jesus' life, he's around 30 years old, and up to this point, Jesus has kind of been incognito. He's been working and serving as a carpenter in Nazareth. He's been kind of on the backdrop, he's been uh, kind of behind the scenes, and he's about to, he's currently launching his very public ministry, 
And with some of Jesus' very first few words, Jesus uses some of his very first few statements and arguably his most important message to define this new kingdom ethic, Jesus says this, and I don't want us to miss it, because in, in his very first few words, with some of the first people that he's met, Jesus is sending people in the gospel ministry. Some of these people he's never even introduced himself to, and he's already saying, I'm sending you on mission. And here's what that means for you and for me. Christians are not just saved people. We are sent people also. Oftentimes we think of Christianity as just some eternal life type of thing. Let's get this taken care of so that I don't go where I don't want to go and I do get to go where I do want to go and so that there's this afterlife. But Christianity is so much more than salvation. It's that Jesus is sending us on mission. This is what he says again in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You were the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus in this moment gives us some categories for what this looks like practically in life. He says you're the salt of the earth. You're supposed to do something. You're supposed to have an impact on things. You're the light of the world. Not just a Motel 6, we'll leave the light on for you. If you happen to drive by, there's gonna be a light turned on for you. We are not Motel 6 people. No, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. Jesus here is insisting that we cannot and must not be hidden. Uh, now, the, the whole passage is undergirded with this urgency of expectation from Jesus. It's Jesus' way of saying, I have saved you, I love you, but I'm also expecting you to do something with what I've done for you. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Anybody smell what I'm stepping in? Are you with me? This can be interactive if you so choose. Jesus didn't just bless me to be blessed. Jesus blessed me to be a blessing. Jesus is saying, believer, I, I've not just made you a Christian so that you can hang around with other Christians and be safe within the context of culture. No, Jesus didn't, didn't just move in us so that we could stay still. He's saying, I've moved in you so that you can move in others in ways that I've done in you. I didn't just put a fire in you so that you could be hot while others are just cold all around you. You know, I've done something in you because I love you, but also one step further, I love all of the people around you. This is the expression of the holistic version and vision of the gospel. According to scripture, I am not just saved by God, I am also sent by God. And when I am saved, it doesn't just change my relationship to God, it changes my relationship with others. It, it changes my relationship with my location, the way that I look at life, the way that I see my relationships, the way that I interact in my job. Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth, which means for us, church family, which means that we don't just live here in South Orange County, we have been sent to Orange County. It means that I don't just go to school at the high school that you're in or, or, or at Saddleback College or any other university. I don't just attend school there. God has sent me to school there. It doesn't, it, it means that I don't just work in this job so that I can make a living until I figure out what I actually want to do with my life. It means that I have been sent to this job. Can we go further? It means that I don't just live in my neighborhood on the street that I collect mail. It means that Jesus has sent me to that spot on mission. Let's keep going. It means that I haven't just been married to this spouse. I have been sent to this spouse by God. Can we do more just for fun? It means that I don't just work it in and out. And thank you, God bless you for the work that you do. 
you are serving our community faithfully. But I don't just work at in and out I have been sent to in and out Friends, God is sovereign. He has saved you and changed you. And everywhere he has you, he has sent you to be salt and light for him. And Jesus says we are to make disciples, which I know can be an overwhelming idea. But don't overthink it. Discipleship is about taking what I know about God and in and then investing in someone who doesn't know as much as I know about God and bringing them up to where we're at. It's life together, life like Jesus. God says you are a disciple maker, a world changer, a paradigm shifter. But Brandon, I'm, I'm just a businessman. Brandon, I'm just, I'm just a teacher, a caterer. I'm just an investor, I'm a banker, uh, I'm an educator, I'm just a college student. I don't have any theological degree. Listen to me, church, when it comes to living on mission, when it comes to going, you can do this. Well, how do you know that? Because I've seen it in scripture, Jesus picked up a ragtag group of uneducated, ineloquent, non-rich, disciples as a reminder to us that God can use us too. And so if you're ordinary, if you're missing some things, if you're a few fries short of a happy meal, if your money's funny, if your credit don't get it, God can use you too. Because Jesus picks the guys who didn't get picked. And that's why I know you can do this too. Because we can't be good enough. We can't be smart enough. We can't be nice enough or pretty enough to be loved by God. We are loved by God because that's who he is, not because of what we've done. And so, we can know with confidence that God is calling us and God is sending us to go on mission for him. God has a fantastic track record of using ordinary people to do incredible things. Look at the story of Peter. Peter always had his foot in his mouth. Thomas was a doubter. James and John, they were arrogant. They had big heads. They wanted to make it all about them. Simon the Zealot. Zealot is code word for I wanna kill someone. He was a wannabe assassin. God used him. Matthew was a tax collector, which means he was a hustler. He was a thief. You can't get more polar opposites than these two people. And yet God used them. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Ruth was a foreigner, a Moabite, an immigrant. Rahab was a prostitute. Moses was a murderer, a fugitive. Jonah was a runner. He was disobedient to God's call on his life. And if God never changes, and he doesn't, it means he's still picking the people that others don't pick. They weren't professional. They weren't eloquent. They weren't impressive. Can I go further? Some of them weren't even faithful. We think when, when we make a mistake, when we mess up, that, uh, that somehow our unfaithfulness is going to change God's faithfulness. Friends, it doesn't. Go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. When they all abandoned him, look at the story of Judas Iscariot, how, yes, Jesus still used him and called him in ministry, and he betrayed Jesus. If Jesus can use these guys, I am a witness that he can use us today. The spirit of God that's on the inside of us is inside of you. And if God is for you, who can ever be against you? Think about how God sees you versus how you see you. God's call on your life, friends, is not a pocket call. It's not like, oh, I didn't mean to call you. <laughs> Sorry, it was just pocket dial. No, this is not a mistake. God has called you. Think about what God says about you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God calls us ambassadors for Christ. He calls us to, to be ministers of reconciliation. Citizens, ambassadors are citizens of 
an entirely different domain than where they're at. They're representatives of their leader. Of course, they understand the cultural context. They may even learn the language of where they're living. They know the culture of where they're at so that they can represent their king to the fullest. First Peter chapter 2, Peter says that we are a royal priesthood, that we are a royalty and that we are a priesthood. Being a priest means we are a mediator between God and others. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, you are my witnesses here on earth. But even hearing all of that, even unpacking all of that, I know that there may still be a disconnect. Because you look at your life and you're trying to reconcile what's gone on in your life or what's going on in your life. You look at what's happened to you. You say, well, how could God ever call me or use me to make a difference in someone's life? I know there's a disconnect, but family, it is time for you to see you how God sees you so that you can do what God has called you to do. So what does this look like? Jesus lays it out here. It looks like us being the salt of the earth. Now, as these people were gathered on the hillside listening to Jesus, as Jesus says to them, you are the salt of the earth, they would have had a very clear picture in their minds of what salt meant. The purpose of salt in that day was used as a preservation. It was a preservative. There were no such thing as deep freezers back in that day that you can fill with buckets and buckets of ice cream. In that day, salt was used as literally a preservative. The only way that you could keep meat from being totally worthless and thrown out was to literally cover it and saturate it with salt. Jesus in this story is telling us that Y'all, the world is a broken place. And unless I send some salt in the world, it will become worthless. And so we're to be a preservative against the onslaught of evil that's all around us. On the other hand, salt was used as a a flavor. Uh, Salt was used to flavor things in in this first century world, Uh, just as it is today in our world. Can I get a tomahawk ribeye witness? Think about that 16-ounce filet that's been marinated for 48 hours and grilled to a perfect medium rare, because that's Jesus' favorite temperature, medium rare. And then you sprinkle a little bit of that pink Himalayan salt on it to get the perfect flavor. Jesus says that's the relationships that believers show up in. This is the way that we are the salt of the earth because we, as followers of Jesus, we know what purpose is. We know what hope is. We know what meaning in life is and people all around us are breaking all apart and breaking down and looking for help and looking for meaning and we know purpose. Purpose has a name and his name is Jesus. So Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, when you think of light, think context. Light brings context to darkness where there is nothing but darkness. When it's dark, you don't know what's around you. When it's dark, you don't know who's in the room with you. When it's dark, you don't know what's going on around you, and so light helps to navigate the context that's only darkness. And so Jesus is saying that your posture, your approach to relationships and the lives around you ought to be such that people should say, hey, how is it that you're able to encourage me all the time? How is it that you're able to serve me when you yourself need to be served? How is it that you're able to help me out when, when actually you need to be helped? How is it that you're able to ask how I'm doing when I know you're struggling in life? And in that moment, we get to go and tell them about our Savior, Jesus. Jesus has a warning for us. Look again at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Jesus' warning for us in in this moment is how tragic would it be if the change that Jesus has started 
how, how tragic would it be if the salt that's flavored us that Jesus has given us, if we miss out on that opportunity? How heartbreaking would it be if we missed out on what Jesus has created us for? How terrible would it be if what's meant to preserve actually ends up destroying? And it can happen to us. I've seen it. Maybe you've seen it because way too many Christians, when they've become Christian and when they've been Christian longer and more and more and more, instead of becoming more mature, Christians become more opinionated. Instead of doing what God has called them to do, they just start doing whatever they want to do and attaching the label of Jesus to it. Have you ever noticed in the church how instead of being like salt, too many Christians are just salty? Instead of being the salt, Christians are just salty. Instead of making a point, instead of making a difference with their life, Christians settle for just making a point in their life. But listen to me. The gospel is not just words we say. The gospel is the way that we live. Did you know that one of the best ways to defend the gospel is to demonstrate the gospel at work in your life? Because the gospel is both declaration and demonstration. The gospel is both confession and conduct. It's announcement, yes, that we announce the goodness of Jesus, but it's also action that we show the goodness of Jesus. Listen, our theology is only as good as the love that it produces. Good theology without love is bad theology. Caitlin Scheiss said this, the gospel that we're so eager to defend comes with an ethic that we cannot avoid. So we've got to regularly ask the question, does my life look like good news? Remember last week we unpacked what it looks like to live as a follower of Christ, to grow as a Christian. And so let's take it one step further that, that public fruit in our life comes from very, very deep spiritual formation in our life. That we become by the grace and the goodness of Jesus, more like Jesus, not in ways that, uh, that, that come in the depth of our knowledge, but in, the, in the, the depth and the breadth of how we love. The saltiest and the most dead body of water on earth is the Dead Sea. Several years ago, we floated in it, and you're gonna float in it because literally the water has so much salt content that you can go and swim in it and, and not even sink. Like, you don't have to worry at all about drowning. And all around the Dead Sea, there is absolutely no plant life. Within the Dead Sea, there is no animal life whatsoever. It's just this large, huge body of water right next to the Sea of Galilee, which, by the way, the Sea of Galilee is just bursting with life. Which begs the question, uh, how and why is the Dead Sea dead? Well, scientists tell us that it's dead because it only has inlets with no outlets. It's dead because water only comes into the Dead Sea and doesn't have a way to get out. Friends, far be it from Mountain View Church to become the Dead Sea of local churches. Far be it from us to have a lot of gospel coming in but no gospel going out. May it never be that we have a whole lot of God's blessings coming into our life, but no blessings going out of our life, which means we have got to go. That we don't just show up to, to receive information and consume church. No, that we show up to be fueled for the mission that God has called us to. Which means for us today that God's call on our life, God's call on your life, and God's call on my life is not a choice to consider. It's a commandment to obey. Jesus is not up in heaven saying, hey, if you wanna consider this. No, Jesus is in heaven saying, this is plan A. There's no plan B for changing the world. This is plan A. When you learn and, and see and lament everything that's going on in the world around us, uh, the war, the genocide, terrorism, 
human trafficking, sex trafficking, political divide, racial trauma, high inflation. God's answer to all of this is for you and I to empty ourselves into the lives of people so that they can know and love Jesus and so that they can find the purpose that they've been put on earth for. This is not optional. God's not asking our opinion on this. Imagine if you've got kids and you go to these kids and say, hey, would you, uh, would you load the dishwasher and run the dishwasher for me? Or, or hey, would you go and clean your room? If you've got kids, you, you likely know that the first response is typically, I don't wanna do that, no, I, I'm doing something else. And in that moment, you go up to your child and you take them by the hand and you look at them in their eyes, maybe even grab them by their sweet little cheeks and say, I wasn't asking you to do this. I'm telling you to go and do this, which is exactly what Jesus is saying to us. Church, I want you to go and make disciples. He's not asking you what you think about it. He's telling us what we have to do to be a part of the world change. It's not like looking at your phone and uh, screening your calls, ah, I'll let this one go to voicemail. No, we've got to go and we will go. And the good news for us is that we don't have to go far because the nations are coming to South Orange County. We don't have to go across the globe to go on mission for Jesus. We can go across the street to go on mission. Right here in South Orange County, over a third of our population were born outside of the United States. Right here in a five mile radius, if you put a pin on Mountain View Church and draw a five mile circle all around our church, almost half of our community is Hispanic and Latino. In our backyard, our neighbors here are Cuban, Haitian, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Brazilian, Colombian, Argentinian, Jamaican, African, Filipino, Chinese, Korean, Indian, Ukrainian, family, we don't have to travel across the globe, we can just go across the street. And so we're gonna start, we're gonna go on mission by going home. We're gonna start by going across the street and living on mission and loving the people that we live with. N.T. Wright said, what's at stake then and what's at stake now is the question of whether we will use the God-given revelation of love and grace as a way of boosting our own sense of self-isolated security and purity, or whether we'll see it as a call and a challenge to extend that love and grace to the whole world. Friends, we're gonna go on mission. We're gonna live for Jesus. We're gonna link arms with gospel-centered organizations who are making an impact right here in South Orange County. And we're gonna meet people where they're at and not expecting them to be where we're at. And we are gonna be a family, we are gonna be a church that loves South Orange County. When John opens his gospel, in the very first few verses, he talks about how Jesus shows up here on earth. And in verse 14, he says that that Jesus became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, which is what I'm praying that we, as a church, would be like Jesus in all of our neighborhoods all across South Orange County. So friends, let's not sit and soak and sour. Let's go and let's reach our community and let's love South Orange County. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we're grateful that you would think to include us in what you're doing. And so God, this morning I pray that that we would be a people who go home living out the goodness of the gospel. God, would you use us in great ways so that others will experience the goodness and the greatness of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen.